everyone. My name is Karen Barbito, and I'm the Director of Programming for Support After Abortion. Let me welcome you to the Support After Abortion Healing Network Facebook Live. It happens every Tuesday right here at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. You are in for a big treat today. We have a very special guest with us. His name is Steve Hokana. Um, he is a retired chaplain, a retired um, Lieutenant Colonel and a chaplain with the Army. But before we bring Steve on, I just want to remind you that we have our virtual conference. It starts tomorrow. The conference starts tomorrow and it runs through Friday, nine to five. There's all kinds of live content. You have to watch it at the time that it's scheduled. But if you can't do that, you can purchase a premium pass for $49 before the conference starts, and then you'll have access to all the content for up to 90 days afterwards. So without further ado, let's welcome Steve to the show. Hey, Steve, how are you? Hey, Karen, how are you today? I'm very good, thank you. I'm not even going to begin to try to tell everybody all your credentialing. There was all kinds of letters and, and things that I didn't understand. So if you could share with those people that are watching um, who you are. Well, sure. Well, my name is Steve Hokana. Uh, I'm honored to be here. This is this is a wonderful day and a great topic to talk about. I just to give you some of the credentials. I have a doctorate in ministry degree with a specialty in spirituality and post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm a member of the Association of Pastoral Clinical Educators. I'm a board certified chaplain. Uh, in addition to that, I'm a diplomate in the American Academy of Experts on Traumatic Stress. And I've, I've done some writing and publishing on this area. I just have a big passion to help people uh, that are going through difficult times in their lives with the power and love of our Lord. So that, that's really kind of who I am and what I try to do. So people, this is the expert on military PTSD and all of those things. So Steve, why don't you tell me why the, and you like, how did you end up in the military and, and why a chaplain? Let's just start at the beginning. When, <laughs> when I was a little boy, I was probably about 10 years old. And I lived in a military area of the country. I lived outside of Washington, D.C. And I went to this friends of mine house and there was a fish symbol on this door. And I knew that from my, my church, we knew what the fish symbol was. I said, well, that's really neat. And, then the, and this guy said, well, that ties into what my dad does. I said, what does your dad do? And he said, my dad's a chaplain. What's a chaplain? And he said, well, that's someone who serves God and serves your country. I got excited. I, see, I said, you mean you can serve God? and your country? That's awesome. How can I do that? And so that really started me on the road to explore the role of military ministry and how we can serve men and women of all flavors, of all kinds and types to help bring them to God. And so it's one of the neatest vocations uh, that someone can ever have. It's just wonderful. So that, that, that's awesome. Um, now, I know very little about the military. Um, I don't know if those of you watching are familiar with the military, but um, I want you to start asking your questions now because I'm sure you're going to have a lot of them um, for Steve today. So just go ahead and put them in the chat right there um, and we'll make sure that we get those questions to him. So you briefly started to say what a chaplain does. Is it the same kind of normal training that other military personnel have? Do you go to a special school for it? How does that work? Well, thanks for bringing that up. That, that is a great question because we're, we're one of the few folks in the military. We're like doctors and we're like lawyers. So we're what we call a direct commission. So it's a responsibility in the case of chaplains that the church trains them. So when I come aboard, you're supposed to get the, the best and brightest Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod chaplain they can. When you see a Catholic priest wearing a uniform, the Catholic Church says we trust you to be the best priest in the world, Baptist, Assembly of God, and so on. So, so that's how you come into the military. We then go to a class. Uh, in this case, they've now moved it to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And we're there to train on how we work in this crazy thing called the military culture. And in this case, the Army culture. And then after that, then we're assigned to various units, battalions, and so on and so forth to serve God and country. Yeah. So you just said a word and I don't really understand it. Um, and just by the way, why don't you just go ahead and share this um, live stream right now with your friends on Facebook and, and like us on Facebook. You never know who's going to see this that might become interested in the military as a result or, or be able to connect with some of the things that Steve's talking about. So just go ahead and do that right now. But you just did say something, Steve, that you, you use the word military culture. Yes. So it, could, it, you, could you describe that a little bit? And how is it different from somebody like me who just lives in general population? Like, well, I, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, for example, we have a way of dressing. 
we have a way of talking. We have a way of acknowledging and recognizing each other. And here's what I mean. You wear a duty uniform. Uh, when you go to physical training in the morning, uh, you're wearing a PT uniform. Then you change into your duty uniform. Uh, so there's a way that you dress. There's a way that you talk. If you're talking to someone that, that is of a higher rank, uh, of you. It is yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, sir. No, ma'am. Uh, and then if you don't know, you'll say, I'll find out as soon as I can. Uh, it's, a, it's a fulfilling uh, ministry. It's a fulfilling vocation to be in the military because you are a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, you, you can be on, on liberty or on leave or on vacation. You're still that soldier, sailor, airman, marine. Uh, the other thing too about the military is that is that we are willing to subordinate who we are for the greater benefit of the United States of America. So mm -hmm. whether we like it or not, we will get deployed to Afghanistan or Iraq or Kuwait. Uh, we do that to be far forward, to protect our nation uh, and defend our country. So those are some of the things that, that we do. And in order to do that, we have customs and courtesies and traditions that help reinforce that. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you touched on a couple of things there that, you know, my job, well, even though I do work a lot, my job's not 24 seven, right? Mm -hmm. When you're in the military, it is, you don't get to call in sick. <laughs> like you have to show up the next day. If you're, you know, like you don't have those kinds of option and, and the discipline and the um, etiquette that you're trained on, right? Like there's order and there's physical training that's just outstanding. And just, and just then when I think about deployment, the the types of stressful situations that you're in. Do they provide anything like, like training for that? Do they help you to cope with the kinds of things that you might be you know, seeing or hearing or being required to do? And by the way, thank you for your service and any military or veteran that's watching, thank you for your service. We would not be free and have the freedoms that we do if it was not for you. So thank you for that. Well, Karen, thank you. It is an honor to serve. I always want to acknowledge those who do come up to us and say thank you. And, and for our veterans who are listening, please do do that. Please acknowledge when someone says thank you for your service. Uh, their, their heart is sincere. They made an, a purpose of intent to come over and talk with you. Um, well, chaplains are part of the preparation for deployment. Uh, among the things that we do is we work with the chain of command. We provide classes on stress, stress management, uh, we even help teach classes on suicide awareness and prevention. Mm. Uh, we, we are that person that you can come to and we can't tell anybody. We have absolute total confidentiality in the military. You, you know, we are not allowed to share what you share. We, we could do it by permission, uh, but it's not our story to tell. So if someone comes to us and they said, Chaplain, I want to talk to you about something that's terribly bothering me, deeply troubling to me. And I don't want you to share this with anybody. My ears have to be attuned. I, I cannot share that with anybody. And what's interesting is the military acknowledges that and they affirm that. They, they want their chaplains to have total, what I call total and complete confidentiality. So that's really important. Okay, so, so like, you know, uh, you can talk to your chain of command about issues and problems, but you can always go to your chaplain first, bounce it off the chaplain, see if the chaplain, he or she has got some ideas on, on how they can find a way to do this innovatively and resolve it at what we call the lowest the lowest level possible. So that, that's some of the things. Constant counseling. Uh, we are allowed to go anywhere that our soldiers go. You can go to areas where you know, the motor pool, you can go to the warehouse, the hospitals, if they're sick, you can visit them in their homes. So it's, it's just a wonderful opportunity. That's awesome. So I think we've really set some great context here about what a chaplain's role is in the military and how you prepare um, people to be deployed. So I can only imagine what you find when people are coming back from deployment. Well, yeah, and, and I also I deploy with them. So and that's, oh, okay. that's one of the things that's helpful uh, when there's a traumatic event on the battlefield. We are not too far away as chaplains. And there's various theories on, on helping and dealing with trauma. Uh, where if you can address the issue as far forward as possible, there is a chance that it could re reduce the symptomology of post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's something really important. I would actually teach a model to the men and women of my organization as we were going off to war, uh, what I would actually call spiritual psychological first aid to help mitigate the symptoms of trauma. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit more about that. That's interesting. 
you know, tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, so people come back, you're the chaplain, everything's confidential. I would imagine that they're coming to you because they're struggling in some way, shape or form. Maybe they have some symptoms of PTSD, nightmares, flashbacks. Can you just talk to us a little bit about that and, and how do you create a safe place so this is where we're kind of getting into the correlation between PTSD, mil combat or military PTSD, and those men and women that have experienced abortion. They mm -hmm. have PTSD symptoms as well. Mm -hmm. And so if you could just develop that a little bit for the people that are watching, then I can draw some similarities to the clients that I see every day. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I, well, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is a diagnosed anxiety disorder. So you know, we don't have to grope at straws about what it is. It's found easily in the DSM-5, the DSM-4TR. It's there. It's an anxiety disorder. The thing with post-traumatic stress disorder is it has to do with intensity and duration. So if you, you and I have undergone a, an enemy attack and, you know, after a couple of weeks, you know, you're just fine. And now I'm starting having trouble sleeping. Well, that's absolutely normal. Now, if these, if these, symptoms continue and endure, then you may have developed post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's something that, that doesn't initially happen right away. You can't get the diagnosis right after a traumatic event. Although there's some places that are looking at different types of blood work to determine that, they're not. It, it's, it has to do with, with the intensity and what we call intensity and duration. So that's really important. So one of the things that we would do as chaplains, at least uh, I'm familiar with doing, and I taught the men and women in my organization, is what's called a safe R model. And this came out of a, a place called uh, the Critical Incident Stress Foundation. I have their permission to use it. And safe R stands for stabilize, acknowledge, facilitate, encourage, recover, and refer. Basically what it means is, is, is if you wanna talk to someone who went through a traumatic event, make sure you're talking to them in a very safe environment. Don't talk to them while enemy fire is still coming in. You know, this is not a place to start processing what went on. And, and the next thing that you do is you acknowledge that, that they have been through a traumatic event and you have to tell them that, you know, your, your vehicle was struck by a main gun round. A couple of people died in it. This is a difficult thing. You went through a traumatic event. And so, and so you want kind of a mutual acknowledgement that that occurred. And the other thing too, is to, to help facilitate understanding. You can say, well, you know, I, I'm here for you. You know, uh, I'm here because I love you because God called me to be here and I'm going to prove that to you. And hopefully a chaplain will prove that every day before the deployment. And so you try to what they call facilitate understanding. And, th and then the next thing you do is that is that you, you pay attention to them. And so maybe a week or two later, or even a couple of days later, you find something positive that's going on in their life and you acknowledge that. You'll say, hey, I noticed that you're sleeping a little better. I saw you eating in the chow hall, the dining facility, and, and you're eating well, you're eating the right kind of stuff. Hey, man, you go, you're doing great. And then what you do is that you, you continue to watch them. And if things are not going well, as, as a chaplain, you benevolently and you lovingly say, you know, I wonder if you're open to seeing someone with behavioral health. And, and I'm going to go with you, if you would like, to encourage you to go see somebody that can help us place understanding on this event. And so that's called a safe R model. And that's something that, that I have taught over the years. And I continue to teach it to various organizations outside of the military. That's so interesting because that's exactly what we do. <laughs> it doesn't have a, a, a snappy name like that, but we do. We want to create a safe place so people can be honest with us about their experience. The one thing you talked about was duration and intensity, yeah. which I thought was really interesting. Um, that's maybe where the similarities stop because an abortion happens very quickly, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's very traumatic and it's very intense, but the duration is really short. Can you talk about how um, women and men that have experienced abortion still um, sometimes have the very same symptoms that oh, yeah. combat veterans do with nightmares and, uh, and triggers like for sounds. And um, I know we're gonna get into this in the conference tomorrow, so I don't wanna talk too much about it, but um, you know, it, so is, is it still PTSD for, for men and women that have had an abortion, even though the duration isn't long? Sure, let, let, me, let me address it kind of in a, in a peripheral way, then we'll get very specific. There's a book written by Judith Herman, a psychiatrist out of Yale University. And, and she thought, and she taught, and she proved that, that men and women, when they go through a traumatic event, they will have the exact same symptomology, they will have the same ways of expressing things and so on. So uh, men and women, when it comes to trauma, they will express it the same way. Okay, so we need to understand. It. The other thing too is that what I meant by intensity and duration is 
if you've experienced an abortion and you're overwhelmed by remorse and guilt and, and physical pain and, and shame, okay, you may heal from the physical pain, but it's going to come back around and, and it's going to hurt and it's going to hurt you real badly. And you may have things like nightmares. Uh, you may feel isolated. You may slide into depression. And, and, and if I could, Karen, this is why if you think that you've, you know, you've gone through a traumatic event, and if you think you may have post-traumatic stress disorder, it is so important that you see a behavioral health care provider. I, that's the term that I use, you know, a psychologist, social worker, someone who's trained in psychometristics, because you may or may not have PTSD. You may have depression, you, but right. you might have PTSD. So, so that's why it's really important. I, I do think that the type of PTSD that, that a, a woman has or a man who's experienced the abortion type thing is gonna have the same deep sense of anxiety and hurt that has occurred. And, and so I think that the, the things that we offer men and women with PTSD for combat are also the same things that we can offer men and women who have gone through the horribleness of abortion. Thank you, for Steve, for clarifying that. We have a question. Um, and I'm hoping that you can have a sense of this. Um, what amount of military personnel look for abortion recovery through the chaplain, or are they aware of the trauma of it as opposed to the regular trauma they experience? So differentiating between combat trauma, perhaps the abortion trauma, and do they come to you looking for help or wanting to talk to you about it? I, I think, Karen, that any chaplain that's worth their salt will have an open door for anything. You have to have that ability of approachability. Uh, you know, what's interesting is some of the soldiers I have experienced, and make sure I answer your question, by the way, is what they'll do is they'll, they'll test me, you know, and it's a joyful testing. They, they may walk past me and utter a vulgarity. So they want to see if I'm going to melt if someone says a vulgar word. And then uh, one time I was in a big massive fest tent with almost 500 infantrymen and I was getting my, my PT shorts on, get ready for bed. And someone starts whistling at me, you know, thinking my derriere is really cute or something, you know, <laughs> I was like, yeah, 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 sure, sure. But, but what's interesting is as I was in my sack and ready to go to sleep, he walks over, hands me a Coke and he starts talking to me about his trauma. You know, he wanted to find out, he wanted to find out, will, will my chaplain love me if I do something stupid? Will he love me if I do something and want to talk about my trauma? So uh, the chaplain should be open to that. Uh, the other thing a chaplain does have is the availability of resources. So, so you go to a chaplain, and if you're a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, and, and you say chaplain, and you might even want to just remind yourself, chaplain, I'm in the area of confidentiality. This is just between you and me. You're my chaplain. I'm your sailor, soldier, airman, marine. I need help. I, I had an abortion, and this is just tearing me apart. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I'm still having physical pain as a result of the abortion. I need some help. Can you help me? Well, like I said, the chaplain's going to have an availability of resources. And so he may, he, he or she may say, hey, look, you know, let me go see what I can find out through the medical system and I'll see what we can do. And I, I cannot believe that there isn't something out there to assist a, a soldier, sailor, airman, marine as they help journey through this, this terrible pain of abortion and, and recovery. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I think in conversations that I've had with you and Jody Duffy, who's been a previous um, guest of mine on Facebook Live, that because of the structure of the military, because of the hierarchy, um, most abortion recovery happens when people are now veterans. They're not actively serving in the military. Is that your take as well, Steve? You know, I, I think that that as we leave the military, we do carry some stuff with us, stuff, you know, and maybe some things that would bring about guilt. A lot of folks in the military join when they're younger and they experiment with life and, and so on. And so they become, they become wiser as they get out of the military. And then when they get out of the military, then they process it. Uh, it's a very cautious period when someone gets out of the military and then when they transition to the civilian world. And this is something I hope all, all of our listeners can be aware of. It's difficult. Uh, I had a wonderful military career. I still had a heck of a time when it came to retiring. Uh, the ability of, of you don't know what you're going to wear every day. You, you don't know who you're supposed to salute or not salute. You don't, you know, and, and it's, it's very difficult. Uh, the whole sense of being a soldier 24 hours a day is now gone. You're just a nine to five guy. And, and it, can, it can be very, very difficult. So at that point, yes. People are going to revisit some of the, the sins of their youth, so to speak, as we hear from Holy Scripture. And, and these things can come back and bite them. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So I want to acknowledge another question that we have um, from Janie. How is what you do as a chaplain different between men and women who come in already post-abortive? And we don't normally use that terminology, but women, men and women that are coming into the military that are, have already been a part of an abortion experience versus those that have that abortion while serving. And so I just want to say one thing before we go to that question. We uh, On Thursday, um, October 28th from 12 to 1, we have a panel of military and veteran experts, which is going to include Steve. It's going to include Jody Duffy, a previous guest on Facebook Live, and also Chet Egert, who is a retired Colonel Chad. Chaplain. And so we're going to be talking about military sexual trauma and how often pregnancy results from that and pregnancy during the military. So I, I don't know if you could answer this question without going too far into detail with that, Steve. I mean, do you see, do people come to you um, as a chaplain because they had an abortion before they came into the military and the discipline and, and everything that maybe has triggered that event to come up or people that have actually had an abortion while serving and still in active military? That's how I hear the question. You know, the, when, when, uh, when you become a chaplain of a unit, you are the pastor, you are the priest of 650 men and women. That's a typical size of, a, of an army mm. organization. You are the pastor to everybody. And so everybody is welcome to come into your office or if you wanna take a walk with somebody, you know, uh, you're always welcome there and you're, and you're welcome to talk to the chaplain in safety. And so there is no difference the way, you know, a chaplain would treat someone. And, and I don't even think a person, the chaplain would even know. He would only, he or she would only know if the person would tell them, you know, yeah. and, then, and then there's an opportunity for, for some good counseling, you know, to talk about that To I would always affirm somebody for sharing that. I would always say, thank you for sharing that. That was very, that was very brave of you to share such a passionate story, you know, that's had an impact on who you are as a person. Um, how, you know, and sometimes when I hit a brick wall with people in counseling, I would ask, actually say, um, how would you like me to respond to that? You know, I mean, do you want to look at it in terms of, of a life direction? Do you want to look at it in terms of, of you're just frustrated and angry and you just want to share it? Um, would you like me to help you find some resources? But one thing's for sure, I will never cease to be your chaplain. I will always walk with you. In, in the Lutheran faith tradition, we use a term called sales zorga. And that term is still used uh, in, in German hospitals. What it is, is it's literally someone who journeys with somebody non-judgmentally. And so I'll, I'll, in Texas, they use the word, come alongside you, right? Well, chaplains will come alongside you. I love that. I mean, you're speaking our language. That's exactly what we do with the women that reach out to us. We come alongside them and we take a healing journey with them. Um, and so I just love that. I don't know. Say that term again. I want to adopt that. <laughs> well, it's called sales sorga. And, sales sorga? Uh, sales sorga. And uh, what, what it essentially means is, is, again, just walking along and journeying. Picture Jesus on the road to Emmaus, oh. you know, this kind of walking, listening non-judgmentally you know see the thing is is when when people come to us we're traumatized okay one of the dumbest things you can do and i you know i'll assume risk by saying this is to tell them there's five things they need to do or there's six things or two or three you know you're you're not doing this or you need to do more they're, they're broken they're hurt mm -hmm. you know you, you come to them and 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 without violating you know any type of a boundary you, you just love them and you encourage them and you thank them for taking time to sit down and talk with you and visit with you. Yeah. As you, start, as you start building that trust, that's so important. That's how you get on the road to healing. You know, it's, it's hard to trust somebody when you've been through a traumatic event, you know, regardless of the traumatic event, it's very hard to trust. And so, yeah, so that, that's, yeah. a, that's a great segue. Let's, let's segue into healing. How, how does that work as a chaplain? How does that, I mean, um, you know, we always say that we have to create a safe place for people to be able to disclose those hardest things for them to say. Um, we've talked about this earlier today. And so could you set that framework? What's necessary for healing to happen? Well, I think the most important thing is always hope. You know, to, to, when someone comes to you in a hopeless situation, you know, it's, uh, if you think you're a little sinner, then you got a little Jesus. You know, I mean, we are broken people. And we are people that, that try as me what as we might. We are sinful people and we need redemption. We need forgiveness. So I, th I think being people of hope is really important. You know, and so what we try to do sometimes, and, and I think the, the sophisticated term is called cognitive reframing, 
I don't like that term. Uh, I think what it is is to say, okay, I want you to tell me something positive that happened to you today. You know, well, nothing happened positive. Did you wake up this morning? I did. Were you able to take a shower? I did. You know, and and so you you have to you have to kind of help people understand that there are good things that are happening for them. Uh, you know, the other thing that I, I think that's really important too is that to to let them know that they're going to overcome this event, that they're going to journey through this. And and one of the things that's really important too is is to find out how do I know when I'm at the end of a traumatic event? And and they've actually documented how you know. This is not some kind of speculation. So just a, a couple of things is that uh, the first thing is you continue in your most positive relationships. So you're able to continue in your worship with God, to go to a church and, and to work with your family, to continue those. This, the second thing is you make friends with the memory. Now, this doesn't mean you have to like the horrible trauma or the abortion, but you, you say things like, you know, that was an awful thing, but it's a chapter of my life and it's not the sum total of who I am. So I'm not totally absorbed and eaten away by this terrible event. That, that's how you know you're on your way. I think the other thing too is to separate the memory of the traumatic event with physical response. So you know you're at a point of healing when you can think about the abortion or you can think about the trauma and you don't actually get what they call a somatic response. You don't get physically ill. You don't start getting nauseated. You don't break out in a sweat. That's a, that's a good indicator. You, you mm -hmm. are moving. And then I think, I think also too is, is to take something that's traumatic. And by the way, I was taught this by a couple of psychiatric nurses at different times. That they said, you know, you're over a traumatic event. And this is so telling. You know you're over it when you can do something positive as a result of the event. Mm. So, so if if you've gone through the horribleness of the abortion, what positive thing you can do? You can put your arm around someone else who's gone through an abortion. You you can actively advocate for the unborn. You can you can tell people that look, if I can overcome this, you can too. But and that's I think one of the most important elements of overcoming mm. trauma is do something positive with the event. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, that's why I'm sitting in this chair, right? That's you know, right. I mean, we, we um, you know, we believe that in order to help people heal, you have to be healed yourself. So, yep. you know, and the great thing about healing is that it's never over. It's a, it's a lifelong journey. There's always, you know, additional growth that can happen. We have another question and then we're getting close to running out of time and I want to set up for your event on the conference. So here's a great question from Jessica. Knowing what you know now about support after abortion, how do you think this resource, us, will be helpful to chaplains who are inactive in the military now? Is there a way that chaplains can refer people to support after abortion or how, how can we partner in, in some way so that we can help those people serving in our military find hope and, and freedom from an abortion experience? Well, I, I, think, I think number one, making sure that the chaplains know that there is a voice out there that is there to help that is there to support somebody. You know, one of the challenges too with a chaplain is you can frequently become a jack of all trades and master of none. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're so busy doing one thing then he gets shifted to another and another and another. So a chaplain needs to find someone to, to take that person who needs some additional love and care and concern. And so this is really important that, that we have this organization to, to send them to that. Uh, there's also uh, different organizations that are a part of this too. And, and I think that uh, Jody and, and Chet can talk about that uh, tomorrow as well. But, but I, you know, the, the abundance of resources is so important and that they're validated resources and that, that the resources must be built upon trust. And so we have an organization, you know, Hope After Abortion that does that, that they build after that. And so that's really important. Sure. Yeah. And so I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Jody Duffy. She is our military and veteran coordinator and is organizing some virtual groups just for military and veterans. We'll be talking more about that during the conference. Um, and uh, Rachel's Vineyard Retreat, who um, Chet Eager, who's going to be part of our panel on Thursday, um, has also facilitated many retreats. So we are designing some, some, some support services for just military veterans and their families. So we have another question, um, and then I'm gonna lead into the conference. It says, does the positive, you were just talking about a positive event, event. does that necessarily need to be connected to the traumatic event? I found that it does. I found that it does. So okay. uh, if, if you were sexually assaulted, 
um, what positive then can come out of that? Now, this is where I, again, I'm really careful with this. I, I would only throw out ideas to brainstorm. I would not say this is what you should do and must do. Mm -hmm. But when you take a negative event, a horrible traumatic event, and you turn it into something positive, yes. And it, and it must be based upon the trauma. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. And again, this, this is also a therapeutic approach as well, not just, not just a chaplain Steve approach. This is a therapeutic approach. Okay, thank you. So we're getting close to the end of our time and I want to give you two more opportunities to talk about things. Again, our virtual conference starts tomorrow. It's live nine to five. Um, the particular panel with the military and veteran tract is on Thursday from 12 to one. I'll be facilitating that and we'll have three experts on that panel. Um, and um, we're going to be talking about different things that we did today. So don't think that you heard it all today because there's going to be new information on Thursday. And so I want to, I want to, I want to give you the opportunity, Steve, you know, for those that are watching, um, maybe they've served in the military, maybe they've had an abortion and had nothing to do with when they were in the military um, mm -hmm. or um, they're in the military now and have an unexpected pregnancy. Um, if there's pregnancy centers around the country that um, have military personnel reach out to them, what, what do you suggest? How do we, how do we create a safe place for them to be able to reach out to us? I, I think there's a couple of things we can do. I think as, as chaplains, if they can have information available to them, if they can have good, strong chaplain leadership. Uh, again, uh, uh, Chet Eggert was a very strong, capable chaplain in his service to our country. You get, you get a chaplain like, like him, you know, someplace like Fort Hood, as he mentioned earlier today, uh, positive things can happen. It has a lot to do with leadership. So mm -hmm. again, again, if we could have folks that would continue to dialogue with leadership that says, hey, this is a good program. This program can help. Uh, anything that's tied to the effective fighting force, the ability of a military organization to conduct its combat operations safely and effectively and bring its people home, they will always listen with attentive ears. So, awesome. you know, and then this may be a little off, Karen, with what, what you're asking, but this is how you make it work in the military. You would come to the military, you go to the Department of Defense and say, we've got something here that can help bring about wholeness and healing in the, in the women and the men in the military. And as a result of that, you will in turn get a sergeant, a specialist, a chief petty officer that's able to focus on the success of their mission. So there's a way that you talk to the men and women in the military to affect positive change in the military. Yeah. You, yeah, and so, so they have to be educated about it and then they have to understand how it's gonna help them as a combat organization. Yeah, and we're gonna talk more about that on Thursday too because Jody Duffy is married to a two-star general. So yeah. we have a strategy going down that lane as, way, as well. So um, I just wanna give a little teaser for Steve's session. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's called RAP 132. Um, I am thinking wrap one, three, two. So make sure you check back in on Thursday and find out what the military panel has to, has to share with you. Please keep an eye out for um, the information on Jody Duffy's virtual group for military veterans and their families. And we have a March Rachel's Vineyard retreat that's gonna be happening in the Atlanta area. We'll have more information on that during the conference. Next week, you're gonna to have to stay tuned because we have a whole lineup of Facebook Live shows happening after the conference. And it's every one of them for the next 14 weeks is gonna be featuring a presenter from this conference. So you do not want to miss, they're gonna be able to expand on the topic that they already talked about. You're gonna learn more about them. This is the Healing Network. We want those nine out of 10 people that don't know where to go for help after an abortion to know where to go. So mm -hmm. we are representing you all. Steve, thanks so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate you. I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. And for all of those watching, I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday, 4 p.m. for a surprise guest. You don't want to miss it. See you then.